said this, the master said that, the master said this, and Mr. Charlie said this, and Mr. Charlie said this. We just changed turn to say the superintendent said this, and the board said this. What do the people say? 20 million black people in this country have been like boys in the white man's house. He even calls us boys. Don't care how big you get, he calls you boys. You can be a professor. To him, you're just another boy. I don't care what cracker say that I'm negative. I don't care. What I'm saying now, and I'm frustrated now because I'm mad because it's getting that way. From now on, don't call me when the kids go off and they go go off again. Don't call me because I'm going to be on the other side pumping up because they won't listen to reason. They won't listen at all. Sometimes he may have been a little harsh in the way he presented what he felt. But sometimes you have to be to get people's attention. And he was willing to do it. Being quiet sometimes won't get the doors open for you. And in a way, I guess he was like Malcolm, by any means necessary. We must return to the land of our ancestors. I will not get on a ship. It may sink time I get on it and leave this country that I have worked work so hard. Our people are confused. They do not know who they are. They call themselves Negroes and color, and they are called speaks. Our women are right. And you argue that we should take this and attempt to integrate into this? Do what you are a madman. I have not lost anything in Africa. I lost it here. Why you lost your mind in Africa? You are out of your mind. Let me tell you that our people must unite and reclaim the greatness of our culture, which we have lost. We have great abolitionists that happen to be white in this country that fought right along with me. So be it. Yet were we slaves. Yet are we lynched in the South today. We must organize. Black people must unite. We are not Negroes. We are an African people. And let me declare now that we have one God, one name, one destiny. Up you mighty people. You can be as great as you will. You people like Henry Carrison that I knew, who were really aware of what Irvin was doing, were very impressed. It was one of the reasons that I met Irvin that Irvin was recommended to me. And so people who knew about that were impressed with what he was doing. It, it, it gave Irvin a legitimacy that a lot of people don't have because he was down there really working to make people's lives better. And he could describe conditions in the black community, I think, or in parts of the black community in, these, in the projects, better than anyone I've ever seen. But most white people are not aware of those programs. And so in that sense, on that level, Irvin was a non-person. They would not have heard of him because he was doing those things. He didn't have, he was not the sort of guy to have a PR apparatus and be out there telling you all the wonderful things he's doing. So they wouldn't have heard of him. Where they heard of him was because they were reading the newspaper or because they were a meeting or a forum that he was at. Uh, many times, Irvin was capable of, uh, in that very soft-spoken way, of getting people so upset that they were apoplectic. And so they remembered Irvin for that more, I think, than they knew about what he had really done. They viewed him as a community activist. They didn't view him as a person who had changed lives through programs because they really didn't know about that. Uh, our program is to deal with the deficiencies that our young people have. So 
uh, one of the qualifications is that you are having some deficiencies in school in terms of your academic achievement. Secondly, a discipline problem. Uh, there's no economic uh, uh, cost in terms of coming into the program. We are trying to uplift the youth in terms of educationally, socially, and spiritually also. So there's n not many uh, qualifications that you have the desire, but we expect certain things out of the youngsters that participate in the program. We expect uh, good discipline. We expect concentration and the willing to learn and develop and become positive citizens in the city. Now, uh, Irvin, in those early years, uh, we would talk sometimes, and Irvin would say, uh, Ted, one of the reasons why I raised so much hell is so that the powers that be, the white folks, will give you some money for your program, uh, and because I know that's a key program to the future of kids in our community. And I said, well, Irvin, uh, I appreciate that, but certainly I don't think it's going to work uh, for the simple fact that your program, Dream Builders, and the other programs that Irvin is affiliated with, uh, are impacted programs. They are empowering programs. They're not programs that make the adults feel good. They're not body count programs where uh, some, you come in and say, well, we administered to or we did this with 200, 400 kids in public housing and it makes the adults look good on paper. Uh, Irvin's program as well as the one that we had, Relay, as well as uh, Nicholas Bright's program, uh, AIDS, A-Y-D-S, were impacted programs. They empowered the kids to uh, have the expertise and the skills that they would need to be successful throughout life. Here in Morningside Home is one of the first communities that felt the impact of Irvin's fight for equality. Now all of Greensboro awaits the end result of Irvin's never-ending struggle. One time I asked him, why was he trying so hard? And he said, look at your own and look out in the street. These kids see these guys out here selling drugs, and they're making probably more in one hour than we could a whole week. Now, how do you convince them to go to Burger King or McDonald's to get a job when they can stand out here and make money like that? You had to think about it. You got to offer them something. You just can't say, well, you need to do this because this is correct, or this is the positive way to do it, or this is the correct way to do it. You got to give them something. You got to show them a different way. And that's what he was trying to do. I look at this gathering today, people are here. What is it that is brought out? Those who are our representatives, what is it that has brought out the history? What is it that has brought this gathering together? It is the man who stood unwaveringly, unapologetically, and touch the conscience of this community until this gathering has come together. You know, I still get goosebumps. I'm getting them right now when I think about Irvin's death. Um, my wife and I were with friends in Mexico. When I'm out of the country, I get uh, often, at that time, now you get emails wherever you are. Back then I would get faxes, but I got a request to call home immediately. And uh, I did call, and they told me, uh, Sherry here at the office, the control of our company, said something terrible has just happened. And then she told me that Irvin Brisbane had just died. Um, as I say, I get goosebumps thinking about it even now. Irvin and I just had one of our dinners uh, within a few days beforehand and uh, we had talked about what he was doing. I knew what he was doing. I, I, I know it now and it, that's one of the reasons it grieves me so much is because I know that the things that he was working on were things that I think that he would have gotten done because I think that he had come to that sort of realization that he needed to get things done now. At any rate, uh, I was asked if I would write something uh, to be delivered at his funeral. 
And I, I did. And uh, Rabbi Fred Gutman uh, read that at the funeral. Later on, the Carolina Peacemaker ran it. Um, and on one hand, it didn't deserve it, but on the other hand, it's not a question of not deserving it. The remarks, I've read them, and, and I think they pointed out some aspects of Irvin that were correct, the role that Irvin had. And I think it's important to understand that, there's, that at the funeral, you were there, I believe, Ted, at the funeral, people were saying, oh, we're going to carry on the work that Irvin was doing. He didn't die in vain. And I believe that I said in that eulogy that he wouldn't be replaced and that they wouldn't be carrying on what he did. And I think, unfortunately, that's been borne out. Irvin Brisbane was the last of his kind. You had to have, you had to come from a certain background and have a certain sort of experience. And probably we would say, thank goodness that people now don't have that. That, that life is not as cruelly black and white, if you will, as it was then. But the fact is that he had a legitimacy that other people do not have. And he was one of those people who was willing to give up almost everything in order to do what he thought was right. Right or wrong, he was willing to just put himself way in the background. I don't see anyone else doing that. I really don't. And I think that if anyone else wanted to do it, that person wouldn't have the legitimacy anyway, because he wouldn't come from that sort of background, wouldn't have spent the time in the trenches that Irvin spent. So. I think that one reason it's important to remember him is that there is not another Irvin Brisbane on the scene. I don't see it, and I defy anyone to tell me that someone's out there and that maybe I'm blind to it. That really is the terrible shame. Right as a person, as a person who was unique in this area, the last of Unique at that time, not unique all along, because there's some other extraordinary people, but unique then because the other people had gotten older. Irvin was still operating like a guy at the height of his energy, and he was just coming to a point where I think he was going to become effective, and it's then that he died. We also need a place where kids that don't have a place in the home, a set of an apartment complex ran by adults, the kids that are out on the street can come to and help get back on their feet in terms of getting in school, graduating from high school, and getting a job. That's needed. So if we don't work with the upper crust of our kids in terms of the uh, 16 to 19-year-olds, they're going to affect the smaller kids. So you can work with most folks say, well, we need to start early. If you start early and work with the, the smaller kids, when they get 16, they will be touched by these other kids. So you got to work with both groups. So. We can start organizing parents first and, 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 and set, the, set the structure together, and we can provide the programs and activities for our kids. It's pulling the parents together first. He was, he was a good leader. He was a good friend. A great father for my children, because after my husband and I split up, it was hard for me as a black woman to try to raise two sons. I never had brothers, so I didn't know the role. Um, when things came up, I would send my boys to Irvin to talk to, you know. Uh, when I didn't know how to deal with things with my daughter, I'd talk to him or he'd talk to her. When I got frustrated about my own life, I'd talk to him. You know, and he'd tell me, you can do it. Just believe it. Get up, you can do it. And I, sometimes he'd make you mad and you just do it just to show him, I can do it. You know, it would piss you off with his attitude, but you know, you would tell him, well, you're not gonna tell me what to do. I can do it myself. Or you're not gonna talk to me. I can talk for myself. And that was good because that's what he wanted you to do. So he was, he was, Irvin was unique. He was just Irvin.
What I remember most about Irvin and um, his commitment and dedication was uh, on a couple of occasions, I went around with Irvin during the day uh, to several schools in Greensboro. And this was back in the 80s, early 90s. Uh, and Irvin would walk in the classroom and immediately there would be uh, anywhere between 10 and 11 young black kids because at that time they were busing them from Morningside and public housing and Irvin just didn't deal in Morningside. He had uh, kids from uh, Claremont Court and from some of the other public housing that were just as familiar with Irvin Hampton Homes as uh, Morningside kids. And so we would walk into a classroom and the kids in the classroom would set up and they would recognize Irvin just as if their father had walked in or something and you would be talking about 10 or 11 kids and not just their response to him but his response to them uh for instance there are a lot of programs again that claim oh well, we got 200 400 kids in the program and we're helping them this that and other and they can't name three kids that they uh have in the program nor can they even talk about how effective the program was or where these kids are five years from the time they were in the program. So, you know, it's a body count. It's nothing more than a body count. But Irvin could tell you where all his kids were in this program. He could tell you what grades they were making. He could tell you uh, what their problems was. And he knew each one of them individually that way. And that type of commitment and dedication uh, is sorely missed, will be sorely missed. Okay, but we have to find leadership. Uh, and I'm going to say it, I'm sorry to say it because Irvin's here. Irvin is an unusual leader. He can lead children, he can lead the community. And uh, honestly, we haven't found anyone exactly as capable of leading as Irvin has. So naturally, when we lose our leadership, we lose some of the things that we offered. <laughs> Leading the kids and doing things like that. But Irvin and I still have a very good working relationship because he's my son. And, uh, and we always <coughs> talk and we develop <coughs> our things. But... No. Uh, if Irving was leading the program, it would be altogether different. Thank you, Joe. I mean, that's a good question. Instead of changing the society, the society has come into the church and changed the church. So churches are responding out of a, a social club type mentality. And so if you don't fit in in terms of how you dress, how you talk, what kind of job you got, and what kind of car you drive, you tend to, uh, uh, you're left out. So youth, it won't work with the youth until we be honest with ourselves, and, and I go to church. I'm a part of a church community. But until we be honest with ourselves and be honest with kids and ask those hard questions, is it feasible for a serpent to walk around and talk to a person and, and give them an apple and cause all the sin in the world? I mean, let's be honest and open with young people. Young people have turned away from the church because the church has not been relevant in terms of a scientific perspective, in terms of a humanistic perspective, and also solving society's problem. We go to church for a good feeling on Sunday, and we go back into a racist and sexist society the rest of the week. And, and I hope people will always keep Irving in their hearts and in their minds. And as I said, if you, even if you didn't like him, you had to respect him. Even people like Elena Strzokki. Because when you're right, you're right. Irvin Jr., uh, not long, not too long after his father had died, wrote a letter, I believe, in The Peacemaker, in which he said that his father was a great uh, role model for young, for young black men. And he was certainly correct about that, but I think it, it doesn't go far enough. It really isn't fair to his father, in the sense that his father was a great role model for any man, and I might say for women as well, because most of the employees here are women. Why is it that people can rest so well when they know things are not well? How is it that people can be so complacent and so at ease in Zion? and seeing the multiplicity of wrong. Mm. How is it, Reverend? I know you preach about the Lord Jesus. I understand your message. I understand your message. I understand your 
naked. But, but can I ask you why? Why? Why is it that people in power can be so unconcerned about people who suffer? How is it that we can elect people who only want recognition? Why? Why is it, brother? Tell me. Let me rest. Yeah. It was never an answer that could completely satisfy. Mm -hmm. He was troubled when he saw those, especially of the religious community, it didn't matter with your faith tradition. <laughs> he asked you why also. It did not matter what you call yourself. If you cannot really satisfy me, then hook up with me so that the wine can become a river, a stream that becomes a river, that becomes an ocean that floods individuals' minds until they answer the question. It was obvious to me that as I looked at his life, Sharon, he walked with God. He was in fellowship with God because he could not stand the things that were not in keeping with what he knew God expected. All right. He understood that from one blood God created all men. He could not understand why we were not brothers and sisters. Come on, God. He understood that there was a rough responsibility to those who had been given much to take care of those who had been given so little. Yes. We could not understand. And you know what, beloved of God, it does not matter how you try to justify it. He walked with God. Yes, sir. It was obvious he was in fellowship, and there are three things I want to leave with you that you can take, Irvin, to know and to remember about your father and the fellowship he had with God. Mm -hmm. It was obvious that he walked with God because he had a passion. I said he had a passion for righteous obligations. Listen, beloved God, some of you are sitting in here listening to me now. You do not see your obligations as a, uh, your, your responsibility as an obligation. You see it as an option. But not so with Irvin. He saw this with passion. He saw his responsibility. He saw righteousness as an obligation. I cannot deny my obligation. I cannot see my brothers and sisters mistreated and feel not obligated to help them. I cannot walk past people because I've got plenty in my pocket and act like that I don't have to share. I cannot accept it. It is my obligation. I am in fellowship with God and as I walk with him, it is my obligation. Some of us need to understand that you got a good talk, but you got a poor walk. You, you don't understand. You got to see that it is your obligation to pull down rascality and to lift up righteousness. And righteousness simply means being right with God. obvious to me that he walked with God because he had a passion for righteous obligation. But not only did he walk with God and manifest that so, he walked with God because he was purposed to relieve the oppression. You see, there's a lot of oppression in our society. Oh, the love of God, we ought to understand that the day will come that there will be a reckoning. Those who are the oppressors will have to deal with God. And that's the comfort I have in good days. You may think it's over. You may think it's arrested. You may think it's done. But I want to give you notice. All of you who participate in oppression, you've got to meet the God who has it locked with us. Yeah. 